Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome. We are live today with a wonderful friend of mine, a precious friend of mine. Mr. Eric Metaxas is here. We're going to be bringing him in in a few minutes. Hello to everybody jumping on in the United States and around the world and to our moderators and Ark of Grace team. Thank you for helping us do what we do for the Lord. Yes, the background is different. The winter decor is down. The spring decor is up. So yes, over the past few days, I switched around the decor now that uh, is getting warmer in New York and we're starting to thaw out from the winter. So let's just open up in prayer. And we, I am going to, after that, we are going to intro Mr. Eric Metaxas and bring him on. So Father God, in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, we come before you. We praise you. You are almighty God. You are high and lifted up far above every power, principality and might. We humble ourselves before you this day, Lord, asking you to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We humble ourselves before you, Father, acknowledging you sent your son, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, to the earth, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He was the Passover lamb, the sacrifice for our sins. He willingly died at Calvary and purchased us by the shedding of his own blood. He redeemed us. He made an open show and spectacle of the enemy before all of creation when he said, it is finished. And Lord, we praise you that Jesus Christ rose again in three days as was prophesied. And after appearing to many, ascended back into heaven, took his victorial, victorious, righteous place at the right hand of the Father, where he rules and reigns forevermore. He is our advocate before your throne. And we honor that before you this day. Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, we invite your presence, the presence of Ruach Elohim, the spirit of the living God, and the presence of the Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit to fill where we are, Lord, Father, that your power and your presence would saturate the atmosphere and go forth, Lord, fill us with wisdom, counsel, might, power, and the reverential fear of the Lord. By the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, by the spirit of the one true living God, may only the truth and power of almighty God with authority now come forth, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, take all the glory for yourself. You are the potter. We are most certainly just the clay. You are the author and finisher of our faith, Father God. You deserve all the glory, honor, and praise, Lord. You are high and lifted up. Let your name be glorified above all. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. Amen. It always feels wonderful when we started out with prayer and we hand it over to the Lord. Now, for our special guest coming on in just a moment, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Eric Metaxas. Many of you know him already, but Eric Metaxas is the number one New York Times bestselling author of Bonhoeffer and many other books, including Is Atheism Dead, Martin Luther, Amazing Grace, and Letter to the American Church. His books have been translated into more than 25 languages. He is the host of Socrates in the City and the nationally syndicated Eric Metaxas radio show, the show about everything. It really is, which also airs as a weekly television program on TBN. And let's bring in Mr. Eric Metaxas. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> I, I I start laughing as soon as I see you. You crack me up. That's that's my highest compliment. That that the it's it's a joy. Joy yes. to talk to you, Amanda. Just oh, a joy. thank you. It's a joy to talk to you. We're happy to have you back. Glad to be back. Thank you. So you've been busy lately. Yes, I've been busy. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, the last year has just been insane. I've never in my life uh, really been through anything quite like it. And um, it, not all good. Sometimes you get too busy and yeah. you realize this is not good. The enemy can use this against me yes. because I'm tired. And so it's been a, it's been a crazy year. Um, I have to say that the book Letter to the American Church, I never I, I just never expected it to be any kind of a big deal. And so. I knew the Lord called me to write it. And so I guess I should have assumed that it would be a big deal if the Lord called me to write it, but it, it is amazing. It continued to sell very well, continues to sell well because I think it struck a nerve. I think people are mm -hmm. realizing that we're going through the most insane times in, in our history, just yes. utter lunacy yes. and brokenness. And so people are turning to the Lord. And I think that you know, um, I can't remember if I spoke about it the last time we were on the program, but it's been turned into a film called Letter to yes. the American Church. And I want to talk mm -hmm. about that. But I just yes. feel it is about it really is about the church being the church. The Lord, what what do the prophets always do? They call mm -hmm. the people of God to be the people of God. In the Old Testament, yes. they call the people of God to be actually be the people of mm -hmm. God. 
Um, and you really could argue that that's a, a, Jesus as a prophet was was doing that as well. He was speaking yes. to religious people of the day and saying that I'm not interested in dead religion. It is from the pit of hell. I'm mm -hmm. interested in your hearts. And so I really think that that's, that's the message that the Lord is constantly speaking. But I know that he's speaking it now. He's been speaking it. Um, you know, through so many voices, but that's why he called me to write the book. And that's why we made it into a film mm -hmm. and the film, I, I cannot tell you it is, I didn't make the film. So people, when people praise the film, I can say, I could take mm -hmm. no credit for the film. I'm in the film. Um, I play, uh, I play a good guy in the film. No, I, yeah. I, I <laughs> myself in the film, but I have a stunt double. All the stunts you do? by another guy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Said, okay. I'm not, not going to jump out of a car, but no, it's, um, Honestly, it's it's a documentary film based on okay. my book, Letter to the American Church. And we are doing free screenings for any church that wants it. Any church wow. in America that wants to do a free screening, we're, we're giving it away for free because I want to get the message out. So I feel an urgency. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know me, so we're, we're on the same page. Yes. And so when you did this movie, Letter to the American Church, what parts of the book did you really drive home in the move in the movie? Well, it's interesting because the I was um, when the book first came out. It's it's yeah. stunning to think about it, but it was uh, it was September of twenty twenty two. Oh my gosh! I like know. It's year, I remember it's, when you gave it to me my the, it, my copy, which is it, on my shelf. It's right. It's the blue. It just right there. By, there it is. Right? Uh -huh. So I spoke to a lot of churches. That's what last year was like. I was crazy. I was traveling, 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 and basically speaking the message of the book, Letter to the American Church, in churches. But one of the first places that I spoke was a um, a church in California. And I think I may have told you about this, but basically um, it, it's kind of, it's amazing. There are these heroic churches in California. When things get really bad, you, you know, yes. people will stand up. So there have been mm -hmm. a number of churches in California. One of them uh, my friend, Pastor Rob McCoy, it's his yes, church. And McCoy. He was hugely brave right at the beginning of COVID and, you know, the whole thing. So he invited me to speak at his church and I spoke there. And two women in the church who who have become friends now, they are like Hollywood veterans. They had been in Hollywood for over 20 years each, just working at the top of their game and gave their lives to the Lord. And so when they were in the church and they heard me speak this message, they said, this needs to be a documentary film. And so I thought, okay, I mean, uh, you know, people like to talk. People like yeah. to say things like that. Well, they did it. They made it into an amazing documentary film. And it's not exactly like they turned the book exactly into a film. I mean, it's, you know, it's an interpretation yeah. in the sense that there's so much that we're saying in the book. But what they do in the film, um, and people can see it if they just go to lettertotheamericanchurch.com. But if you go to lettertotheamericanchurch.com, you can... Uh, well, there's a lot of stuff there, but I will go into it later. But I guess the, the point is that um, the film, what they do in the film is the, I'm the main voice of the film. So I am, you know, speaking to the camera mm -hmm. and speaking out of the book. I mean, they they scripted it for me, right? They yeah. put it in, you know, and I we filmed it in Los Angeles. But what they do also is they interview people. So when you think of all the issues, when, when I talk about in the book, Letter to the American Church, we're talking about all these issues that the church, many mm -hmm. churches, many pastors are silent in the face yes, of very evil. Much right? so. they yes. say, oh, we just want to do church. We don't want to, we don't want to mm -hmm. be controversial. And you're thinking, really, is God calling you to be silent in the face of evil? There are people whose lives depend on you, Mr. Christian, Mrs. Christian, to speak the truth of God into the situation. Mm -hmm. So the transgender lunacy is destroying lives, tearing apart families. Are you being silent on that? The open border mm -hmm. is destroying lives. Uh, uh, children are being raped. We've got gangs taking over, pouring fentanyl into the country. Mm -hmm. Millions of people's lives are being affected by this. Yes. Are you being silent on that? Are you being silent that that uh, you know sexual uh, lunatics are bringing pornography into your children's schools? That they are pushing this stuff on your kids yeah. and they don't want you to know about it. Uh, it no. goes on and on and on and on. Wherever you look, it's cultural Marxism uh, really infiltrating the churches, infiltrating the culture and the churches. Mm -hmm. So we've interviewed, we interview all these people in the film so you can kind of get perspective on each of these things. So I don't go into that in the book. The book is more general. 
But in the film we have, we interview Charlie Kirk, we interview James Lindsay, mm -hmm. uh, who is an expert on cultural Marxism. You know, he breaks it down. Uh, Pastor John Amanchukwu, that man is a hero. He goes into school board meetings all over the country and reads from these pornographic books that are in the kids' mm. library. And when they stop him, he says, you've got a problem with me reading this at a school board meeting to adults? This is in your children's school. Why don't yeah. you take, so oftentimes cops come, they, they you know, so there are everywhere you look, there's lunacy in the culture. And we have Christians that are kind of experts on each of these topics. They yes. interview Pastor Rob McCoy himself. They interview uh, my friend, Pastor David Engelhart, the church mm -hmm. that I go to in Manhattan. Whenever I'm here on a Sunday, I go to King's Church right here in Manhattan. David Engelhart is the pastor. So they interview all these people. They interview uh, Victor Marx. My goodness, what a hero he is. And his wife, Eileen Marx. So they interview all these folks uh, and probably somebody I'm forgetting just to kind of unpack the different issues and why the church needs to speak out on these issues. If you're not speaking, if you're going to a church that's just playing church, um, I just want to tell people, and I've said this over and over, you're under judgment because the Lord calls the church to speak mm -hmm. out boldly for the sake of those outside the church, people whose lives are being torn apart. They, they're sending their kids to schools and they're, they're trying to make a living, trying to pay the bills and all this stuff is going on. The yeah. church ought to be at the forefront of all these. So, uh, you I know, totally all agree. in the film letter to the American church.com. And as I say, uh, I I'll, I'll repeat it over and over. We are making it any church that wants to do a free screening, any church, one no strings attached, zero strings attached. We want to make it available to churches to screen it uh, for their people. And they could go to letter to the American church.com to do that. Yes. If you go okay. to letter to the American church.com, all the information is there. And we're, we're updating the list of churches that have already offered free screening. So if you're okay. in the neighborhood, you know, you can see that there's a free screening here, 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 all, you know, all mm -hmm. the dates, everything. There's like a couple of hundred churches have already signed up for free screenings. I might know a church. Oh, might you? I go to, yeah. <laughs> yes, the, the, the one I go to, actually. Yeah. So uh, Pastor Sam might be very interested in that. Um, but you are working on something. Actually, it's coming out in April, I believe. And this well, is sort of a sequel, right? To Letter to the American Church. You know, it's interesting, Amanda, since you're, you know, a, a, a prophet and, and God speaks to you that way. I The Lord doesn't speak to me the way he speaks to you, but mm -hmm. I have reconciled myself to the fact that Letter to the American Church and the sequel, I'm speaking prophetically. I've never spoken prophetically to the church mm -hmm. before. Always, I was just writing books kind of for everybody. I mean, yes, yeah. they were aimed at the church, but they were aimed past the church at anybody who's interested in history, anybody who's interested in whatever I'm writing about to try to to try to woo them in mm -hmm. our direction, you know, evangelistically. But this book, Letter to the American Church and the sequel, uh, it's called religionless Christianity. I'll talk about that in a minute, but they are definitely aimed at the church. If mm -hmm. you call yourself a Christian, this book is aimed specifically at you. Uh, and I never, it's just a weird thing. I never expected to be writing these kinds of books, but I just know the Lord's called me to do it. And I'm, I'm saying what I believe the Lord's calling me to say. So it's, uh, it's interesting. Now, the other day I was talking to somebody from Daystar TV, Johnny mm -hmm. Lamb's, uh, uh, network. And, they're going to have me on uh, the program when I'm in Dallas uh, in a couple of weeks. And so the producer had read the book and I said, Oh, you're the first person to have read my new book, religionless Christianity. Mm -hmm. I, you know, we haven't shared it with anybody. And so she said to me, and I, I really was taken aback. I thought that's very interesting. She said, Oh, this is the third book in the trilogy. I thought, what are you talking about? She goes, well, Bonhoeffer mm -hmm. letter to the American church true. and religionless Christianity. And I thought, you know what? That's kind of true because it's they're all in the vein of Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer is the, the big book, the biggest book yeah. I ever wrote. But that tells the whole story of what happened in Germany when the church chose not to fight, when the yes. church said, we're going to we're going to go over here and be quiet and just do our little services mm -hmm. while evil takes over. So that's the first book. And then this is Letter to the American Churches is, is really the follow up to Bonhoeffer and religionless Christianity is uh, obviously the sequel to Letter to the American Church. And the title, I got to explain that title. Yeah, yeah. This is an interesting title you've chosen. Well, it's 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 definitely the clunkiest title you could ever choose. It's a weird phrase, religionless <laughs> Christianity. Why mm -hmm. did I choose it? Well, mainly because Bonhoeffer used it. Bonhoeffer scholars know this uh, 
know the term religionless Christianity. Uh, and most Bonhoeffer, Bonhoeffer scholars are very theologically liberal. They're really agnostics. And they hate me because I told the truth about Bonhoeffer. I wasn't really even trying. Yeah. I just said, I'm just going to write my book. But in the course of writing my book, I realized that what Bonhoeffer meant when he used the phrase religionless Christianity is 100 per, 180 degrees away from what these liberal scholars have interpreted as. So I'll yes. explain. Uh, the phrase religionless Christianity appeared in a letter. Bonhoeffer, I mean, this is crazy stuff. He's in prison. Mm -hmm. It's at the end of his life, 1944. Yes. He's in prison. Uh, I think he knows at this point that he's probably going to die. And he writes a letter to his best friend, Eberhard Beitke. And I met Eberhard Beitke's wife and spent time with her. I met their uh, their daughter. And Beitke was Bonhoeffer's best friend. And he was theologically brilliant as Bonhoeffer mm -hmm. was. And Bonhoeffer writes a letter to him. And you imagine this brilliant guy writing to another brilliant guy, kind of almost in this code, right? Like he's not writing yes. for everybody. He's just mm -hmm. writing for his friend. And he basically says that what we missed in Germany, the reason we've you know, fallen under the evil of the Nazis is because we were doing dead religion. We were playing yeah. church. And so he uses the phrase, he says, what we had, what we needed was a religionless Christianity, not just religion, but the real thing, the faith mm -hmm. that's 24 seven, where people are really born again, living out their faith, uh, living out the Sermon on the Mount, not, not just acting like, oh, that's extra credit, you know, yeah. no, that's what it is to be a born again on fire believer. So Bonhoeffer wouldn't have used that, the kind of language that we would use, but it's so obvious if you know him and you read everything he wrote, where he's coming from. So in this letter to his friend, he uses this phrase, what we, what we had needed was a religionless Christianity. Mm -hmm. And for him, because he was a disciple of, of Karl Barth, they use the word religion negatively. In other words, it's just dead religion, just ritual, yeah. religiosity. And, and he says, we needed a religionless Christianity. And so Bonhoeffer scholars, the liberal ones, interpreted this. This is like a scandal for mm -hmm. 50 years. They, oh, that's the Jubilee. 50 years, Eric. Oh, there you go. go. There you go. <laughs> So for about that long, until I wrote my book, a lot of people interpreted the phrase religionless Christianity exactly the opposite of what I just said. They said like, oh, Bonhoeffer was drifting away from traditional Christianity towards some kind of ethical humanism. Or I mean, it's, it's I'm not going to waste your audience's time with it, but it's garbage, absolute like academic theological garbage. It's not true. And when I wrote my book about him, I'm coming in, you know, naively kind of just looking at it and thinking, I'm not seeing what they're seeing. Where do they get this from? And you realize they get it from nowhere. They pulled it out of a hat. They made it up. They basically wanted to believe that Bonhoeffer was theologically liberal and really agnostic like they were. But the reality yes. is, no, he was not. And so religionless Christianity, it's Bonhoeffer's phrase, but it really means the true faith, in other words, instead of playing church, instead of saying, well, yeah. we go to a church, we sing nice songs and, you know, mm -hmm. we believe, well, are you really living it out self-sacrificially, risking your life, risking your reputation? Are you willing to do that? Because yes. people all over the world for 2000 mm -hmm. years have risked their lives, have been tortured and killed and, and, and been driven from their homes because of their faith in Jesus. Are you willing to live that way? Well, most Americans... And most people in Germany at that time, they were not. They had it comfortable. Everybody's a Christian. Well, we know what that means. If everybody's a Christian, it means nobody's a Christian. Yeah. It means you're just plain church. Uh -huh. So Bonhoeffer says that this is what we needed. If we had had that, if the church had really been the church, we would have never slid in this direction where evil took over, demonic That's evil true. killing millions of people. So that phrase, religionless Christianity, it kind of hit me. And again, this is where I have to assume that it's prophetic because I felt like the Lord saying, you know what? Um, Bonhoeffer wasn't just speaking vainly, like, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we had had this? But it's almost like he's saying, what if we could have this in the future? What, yeah. what if in the future uh, people would, instead of having dead religion, they would see the mistakes that we made and that they would choose a religionless Christianity? So I made it the title of my book, and the subtitle is God's Answer to Evil. Mm -hmm. is that if it the is. church will be the church, there it there is. is. The church will be God the church. Evil. 
and and do away with religion and really embrace the faith wholeheartedly, not play these religious, theological, ecclesiastical games, but really embrace the faith and live out the faith the way God calls us to, um, we will see something. It's not just the defeat of evil, because what we're all hoping, of course, is that the church will wake up mm -hmm. and that we will defeat the evil, uh, whether it's the deep state, whether it's the globalists. We understand that we're facing satanic evil in our time. But I really say at the end of the book, Religionless Christianity, uh, which is coming out in April, uh, I say that I really believe it's the Lord's will, not just that we kind of avert the disaster. Because that's, you know, yes, you have to, w to win a war. You know, you've got to be all in. Yes. And you don't want the enemy to win. But if the enemy doesn't win, who wins? God wins. God's people win. And we could have a new birth of freedom. I, I, I talk about uh, Lincoln's phrase, a new birth of freedom. So I yes. think that ultimately what I'm hoping and what I believe is the Lord's will is that, you know, the church will wake up in the in this year ahead as we see the satanic evil and that that as the church wakes up and understands our role, we won't merely avert disaster, but that we will have revival we will have reformation that a few yes. years from now we'll be in another world. Just as imagine, you know, when they won the revolution, they didn't just say, well, we beat the British and now we get to live here. No, they inaugurated a new way of living, self-government, never been done in the history of the world. And it opened up doors upon doors upon doors in history mm -hmm. because they won that war. And so I really believe that's kind of what God is saying right now, that this is not just about averting evil and disaster, but it's about when you do that, God's going to give us uh, victories that we haven't even imagined to see the gospel played out in every sphere in our culture. So ultimately, religionless Christianity, I, I, I paint a positive picture, mm -hmm. picture, but the prerequisite is that the church would be willing to fight uh, and understand where we are. So that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. There's a lot of crazy stuff in the book, religionless Christianity, which we can touch on another time or today yeah. or whatever, but it's, it's unlike anything I've ever written to be quite honest. You know, what's interesting about just averting evil is you still leave the roots for evil to grow back. That's right. You want the roots completely torn up and removed so nothing else of that nature can grow there. Well, see, that's what's, that's what's interesting to me. And I think I talk about this in letter to the American church, um, or maybe I talk about it in religionless Christianity, but the idea that like, when you think about people, uh, when we had the Soviet union, right. You had two kinds of, of, of people in America, right. Who, some who would say, well, uh, you know, we've got to make our peace with the Soviet Union. We've got to have detente. That was the famous phrase, Kissinger, Nixon. Mm -hmm. We've got to have detente, you know, that we're going to kind of let them, you know, exist. And, and we're not going to, nobody's going to win the Cold War. Um, so in a sense, it's sort of like saying, we're going to make peace with the devil. We'll give him and what he wants. And you can't. Well, obviously, yeah. you can't and you shouldn't. It's immoral. So you need to be prudent. You need to be wise. At the same time, you should be asking God, how can we defeat evil? Uh, how can we uh, win the Cold War? So Reagan and others said, we believe we can win the Cold War. We need to fight to win because uh, there are people uh, in, in uh, the Soviet Union, they're under a communist dictatorship. If you try to have church there, they're going to throw you in prison. They'll kill you. This is something that we should be fighting to win. And Reagan was the one that you know le led the way along with Margaret Thatcher and Pope John Paul II, and they, they basically said, this is a, an evil empire. And I really think that that's what it boils down to. There are people that have uh, no patience for evil, and they say, we need to fight and win by the grace of God. And then there are other people who say, mm -hmm. you know what, we can't win, so let's just make peace with it. Let's just, you know, we don't want any trouble. We don't want any trouble. We don't want to fight. So you just, you do your evil thing over there, and mm -hmm. we'll be over here, and we won't bother you. And you think, what is God saying to do? Is he saying to, to don't, don't believe you can defeat evil, just sit over here and let them do their thing? I really think that that's where we are today, is that God is calling his people to say, I, I want to give you the victory, because there are people all over the world, not just in America, who are looking to the American church to lead the way it's in true. fighting. And 
I believe it's a glorious adventure. The Lord calls us to this. And I, I believe that's where we are in history. This is not just some ideas. I believe this is where the Lord has maneuvered us to this point in history to believe him for victory. Uh, and so ultimately it's exciting, but we need to know where we are. We need to know what's at stake. We need to know who the enemy is. And I talk about in the new book, Religionless Christianity, I talk about, you know, the globalists, uh, the cultural Marxists, they mm -hmm. are 100% the enemies of serious Christians. They don't, if, if you're just a, a dead churchgoer, you know, who that's, that's no threat to them any more than dead churchgoers are any threat to the communist Marxists. And they'll give you your little, your little official churches, go in that building on Sunday morning and you do your, what do we care? Just don't you dare say anything to us about how to run the state. When mm -hmm. the, when the church starts getting involved in, in everything, that's when it's a threat to the power of the glob globalist elites, the Marxist elites, it was a threat to Hitler. So when the church is just willing to play church, to do its little, play its little role, that's the enemy's church. That's the devil's church. He's like, that. I can work with a church like that. Go ahead, keep having your little religious service. That's a recruited church, I call it. That's right. Say, that, say more about that. I like that. That's a recruited church um, because I fully and firmly believe that that side of wickedness and darkness has recruited churches and pastors to purposely feed people everything that is defiled to keep them from being able to discern. It's like they break their discerner. And so then it's like, now you broke my discerner. So now they can't discern anymore, you know, what they should be doing as soldiers in the armies of the living God and servants of the most high God and how they should be the standard we were called to be at the, as the church you're in this speaking, nation. You're, you're singing my song. That's why we're <laughs> friends. I just love that. That is, And listen, that is exactly correct. And there are many, many churches in America that are that kind of church. And I mean, we know we lost the mainline denominations a long time ago. I mean, the yeah. Episcopal church, the Lutheran church, whatever. whatever. there's just a few outposts there that are standing strong. Uh, I had a Lutheran pastor on my program this morning yeah. uh, fighting uh, you know, against this uh, gay mafia that that wants to to, to that's what it is. This is a, but in the evangelical church, Amanda, in the mm -hmm. evangelical church, we have many many pastors and Christian leaders who are playing the devil's game. Uh, we've had some Christian leaders, John Maxwell, um, uh, Rick Warren, others that are telling, you know, thousands of pastors, don't be political. I got to tell you about a dream I had after you die. You're going to find this. Well, I'm just saying it's like, so, so there are many people who go to evangelical churches that are utterly guilty of this. And that's yes. ultimately my book letter to the American church is at those pastors. It's like, Hey, pastor, mm -hmm. are you speaking the truth of God or are you just playing church? Are you safe? Uh, or are you like a roaring lion? Aslan in the, in the, in the Chronicles and Arnie, he was yes, not yes. safe. He was good, but he was wild. God calls us to be wild and good uh, and a threat to evil. And so there are many evangelical churches that are totally, totally guilty of this. Many leaders I mentioned, uh, you know, Rick Warren and and uh, John Maxwell and, you know, forget about uh, uh, Andy Stanley and Russell Moore and um, all of these folks, they are abdicating uh, against evil. They're basically saying the church should stand down, mm -hmm. don't get involved in any of this culture war stuff. And you think, when... Did God say that when slavery was an issue? Did he say to the church, don't get political. Don't touch that issue. Don't mm -hmm. touch the issue of the unborn. Don't touch the issue. I mean, all these stuff, these are Christian values come into that situation and bless people. And so I really just believe that, you know, we're in a war and, you know, you, you just said it, uh, there are churches that are, um, what was the term you used again? Recruited church. Recruited churches. But I mean, look, mm -hmm. that's in China. If you're in China, and yeah. you say, oh, we want to go to the official church. The government has no problem. Go go to that little useless, dead little official church. The underground church, those are the ones that scare the communists. Those are the ones that the communists mm -hmm. are at war with those pastors. Well, uh, we need that kind of a church in America. We need an underground church in America. Um, but we have no excuse. We don't need to be underground. We can be public. We have laws. Yeah. We have the constitutions uh, backing us up. So now, of course, you've piqued my interest about your dream. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this happened at the end of February, this dream. I actually spoke about it when I went to Louisiana, the Lord had sent me to Louisiana uh, to speak. And so this was the dream. There was a man, 
Okay. Now I'm going to say this, this gentleman very much resembled TD Jakes in the dream. Okay. And I was given $200 and I was a little confused as to why they would give me $200. But then they said, oh, you're going to help us prepare a meal. So I'm thinking, oh, maybe this money is to go towards buying the stuff for the meal, right? This is, you know, in the dream, you're going to help us prepare a meal. And they take me back to a back area where the people can't see. And there's this long, narrow black table. And on this long, narrow black table was everything that they wanted to use to prepare the meal. And it was the largest maggots I have ever seen. Insects, enormous, all on this table. And they gave me this object. It, it had a handle and it had this round circle attached to it and it was metal. And they said, you, you, oh, you're supposed to take this and smush everything so the people don't know what they're eating. Did they use the word smush? Well, I'm, I'm saying that, but they they literally <laughs> wanted me to like, that's what they wanted me to do. Totally. Like, I don't know what else to crush, right. but they wanted me to basically pound it into oblivion. So then it could, didn't resemble what it was. It just oh. looked like a filling that they could put in to feed the people, but it was everything defiled. And I got incensed and I'm like, where did he go? I'm yelling in the dream because I, I'm like, he's getting his $200 back. Cause now I knew what that was for. It was a bribe. Right. And I wanted yeah. nothing to do with it, but they literally are downright trying to replace. They're not trying to put fillers in the meat anymore of the word. They're downright replacing it with everything wow. that is defiled. I didn't get that. Now I get it. Okay. Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. And I woke up. Well, you, I assumed you woke up eventually because here we are, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but honestly, um, listen, this is kind of the point of, of the book letter to the American church. There are people, they think they're in a church. They think they're hearing the word of God, but if, if you're not speaking what God is saying, you know, it, it's kind of like if you ask a kid, mm -hmm. uh, listen, uh, you know, you get an allowance, you get a da, 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 right. Well, I want the car washed, uh, tomorrow morning. Right. Very important. Uh, next day, is the car washed? No, but I took out the garbage and I did the dishes. Did I ask you to take out the garbage and do the dishes? No. So you're trying to play a game. You didn't do what I asked you to do. God is asking us, you know, to do X, Y, and Z. And people are saying, well, I don't want to do analogy. that. But I'll do, I did this and this and this. And we sang mm -hmm. our hymns and uh, we, we preached, you know, a biblical sermon. And I think, well, you know, they preached biblical sermons in Germany in the thirties, were those biblical sermons, the kind of sermons calculated uh, to get the people to stand against the satanic evil of the Nazis, no. or were those biblical sermons calculated to get the people to not focus on the evil of the Nazis and to mm -hmm. let it go. That's when you really think about it. And this is why that the new book is called religionless Christianity. There's nothing more satanic than Christian religion, not, in the service of God. In other words, it's, it's hideous. It's not in other words, when a pagan is a pagan, you say, well, that's, they don't know any better. They're being pagans. But when Christians are serving the devil's purposes, there's something really satanic about that. And when you think about it, think about the religious figures in Jesus's day. They yes. were not pagans. They were not pagans. They were not non-believers. They were all mm -hmm. in with religion. They knew more backwards and forwards. They knew the scriptures. They knew everything. And they were of their father, the devil. Because Satan right. knows the scriptures too. People have to realize this. So what is more horrible, more evil than religion serving the devil and pretending to serve God? Mm -hmm. That is what we're facing in America. Yes. And that is where we are right now. And that's why I say to people, if you're going to a church that is not all in, on this stuff that is not standing bravely against the evil that's rising all around us. That's saying, well, we're going to take a pass. We're just going to, we're just going to do church here. We don't want to offend anybody. Um, many of them are convinced that that's, that's what they're supposed to be doing. Well, it's not, it's what the devil wants you to be doing. And so this is a, a wake up call. A letter to the American church is a wake up call and religionless Christianity is the follow up. And obviously the film, uh, you know, for people who aren't book, big book readers, it's yeah. to wake them up and to say, the hour is very, very, very late. If we don't wake up like this year, it's over. We don't have five years. This is not, it's not 1985 and mm -hmm. Tip O'Neill is the head of the Democratic Party. That's we right. have very, very wicked figures 
uh, Marxists, uh, atheists, people who hate America, people who hate Christians, people who are using the government to come after Christians. I'm not making this up. This is they're happening weaponizing right it, and they're weaponizing the justice system. Yes, you know, and they and they have Satan has hijacked a faction of the church for his own purposes. And judgment begins in the house of God. So the Lord is going to purge the church one way or another. I believe it will that. Be purged. I believe that. Mm -hmm. And um, so let me ask you. How many pastors since Letter to the American Church have read it and woken up and contact you and said that this had a light bulb go off in my head? I don't I don't get a lot of uh, of people contacting me like that. And that's mm -hmm. it's interesting to me because I think that for some people, uh, maybe there's shame. Maybe they yeah. feel like, well, I missed it and I don't it. it it's interesting, Amanda, because how how information travels. Right. I know anecdotally that this is happening, mm -hmm. but the media is not reporting on it. How is anybody going to, you know, it, it's one of those mm -hmm. things that it's happening, but it's kind of undercover. People don't know how many Christians are waking up. I mean, I just believe that the crazier things have been getting uh, with a stolen election, a yes. COVID mandates, I mean, the, the, the vaccine on mm -hmm. and on and on and on. How many people are awake today who were asleep at in the beginning of 2020. That's how true. many people every day are waking up more and more and more and more. How many people do you know and do I know that have had horrible side effects from mm -hmm. the vaccine? Uh, I have two friends uh, that died of these incredibly aggressive cancers. I'm sorry to say, I'm sure uh, mm -hmm. that at least one of them, the vaccine was at issue. I have another friend uh, who just had her face paralyzed. I just, wow. I know people who got the vaccine. And I'm thinking in this day and age, my guess is that that is what caused it. And I could go on. That's just the vaccine. There are things going on out there. Um, and I, I think people are waking up every day to understand that we are, uh, we're in a new day and we need to stand up. We need to be part of the solution. What is God's solution? We want to be part of God's solution. So I don't know. But I, I do believe anecdotally uh, that that is exactly what is happening. And that's been happening, you know, again, since the beginning of the lunacy uh, in 2020 until today. And, you know, we'll, we'll never know the details till we get to heaven. But I have to tell you, I, I don't believe the Lord called me to write this book for nothing. In other words, I, I, right. I feel that, that this book, um, you know, the Lord will sometimes give you signs. So when I, when I felt the Lord called me to write the book, I was going to... Um, and this, I'm talking about letter to the American church. I was going to publish it myself. I had never published a book myself ever, but I thought, you know what? I think I'm going to publish this book myself. I just need to get it out. The Lord called me to write it. I'm just going to write it and just publish it. And it's going to go wherever it needs to go. And then I had a meeting with my publisher who said, well, we got some ideas for books for you. And I was like, well, I'm not interested, but I'll have the meeting to be polite, you know? Yeah. And in the meeting, the first book they described was letter to the American church. They basically described the book. I said, wait a minute. How did you like I haven't shared with anybody that I'm writing this book. So it was a sign from the Lord. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really one of those remarkable moments where you go that, that was God. That was that, that, that's God. That's amazing. So I yes. published it with them. And that was one sign. Then, um, I was, uh, I was at Hank Kuhneman's church in, um, uh, in Omaha, Nebraska. It was a flashpoint thing. And he prophesied over me and I'd never met him before. And he's prophesying about this book. And I thought, this really sounds like the Lord. It was one of those things where you just go, whoa, yeah. like this is a whoa. And like literally eight months ago, six months ago, Suzanne, my wife, we had decided to make this into a film. And now that's, that's another thing I got to say is that when these folks want to make it into a film, I go, that's God. I mean, that's, I never even, never even occurred to me one second to turn it into a film. I want to turn most of my books into streaming TV series. We're trying to raise millions of dollars because I really believe in mm -hmm. reformation and revival and that we need to feed uh, people this, yes. you know, God's narrative of history and science and all. So I'm working on all that stuff, but it never occurred to me once to take a letter to the American church, make it into a film. Never occurred to me. So when these folks said we want to do this, I thought, wow, that's, that's gotta be God. I mean, I couldn't have even imagined. So they make the film and so on and so forth. So about six months ago, Suzanne, plays for me the prophecy that Hank Kuhneman did live on Flashpoint over me in the book. And in the prophecy, now this is 
like I think it was August of 2022. Uh, so the book has barely come out or didn't even come out yet. Okay. And he prophesies over me. And in the prophecy, which I forgot all about it till Suzanne played it for me, he says, and, and people are going to be watching this on screens. And we said, what? Suzanne and I said, watching this on screens. That, that This is like many, many months before anybody mentioned making it into a movie. But 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 he he prophesies this. I mean, he's talking about a book. So I really believe from the beginning, the Lord has purposed this for what he wants to do. Yes. Again, it's, it's only a small part, but it's the part that the Lord has called me to. And the film, um, I'm I'm convinced is reaching people, is waking people up. It's it's really start where I, I believe it's about a movement. It's about a movement of God that is going to result in revival. Uh, and in reformation. And I say reformation because a lot of times people always talk about revival. People could say, people could say, well, great that people get saved, but guess what? That's the starting line. When you, when you get saved, you've just crossed the starting line of the life God has called you to you. That's not the finish line. You don't go into the grave. The minute you get saved, you don't go to glory. That second you're here now, now you're a born again believer. What has the Lord called you to do while you are still here? He has appointed works for you to do. And I really believe that's where you get into this idea that People are going to come to faith and the Lord is going to call them, is already mm -hmm. calling them to do wonderful things, to get involved in the seven mountains, to get involved in media uh, and in entertainment and government and everywhere you look. If believers will bring God's values into those spheres, we're going to see a new world because what we've had Amen. a lot of is Christians that say, well, I'm, I'm a Christian, but they don't live out their faith. We've had Christian politicians that who cares if you're a Christian, if you're not boldly living out your faith. That's true. You know, Jimmy Carter was a born again believer, but he didn't bring those mm. values into the White House. He didn't know how. We have a lot, we've had a lot of believers uh, in the, Mike Pence, classic example, right? He's a Christian. Well, when push comes to shove, he, he doesn't act uh, the way I think God would call mm. a Christian to act. And he's unaware of it. He thinks he's just being a nice guy, right? But yeah. you know, in 2015, he vetoed, as the governor of Indiana, he vetoed, um, a religious liberty bill that had been put out because the Chamber of Commerce and all these people said, oh, we're going to get boycotts. We're going to lose money in the state. And, you you know, we cannot have Indiana stand firm on religious liberty because we're going to look like bigots. And we get he vetoed it. He mm -hmm. came in. Christy Nome uh, in uh, South Dakota did the same thing. So these people that you kind of think like they're on the right page. The Lord is the Lord can use a pagan to do the right thing. And he yes. often does. Mm -hmm. And and so that's why I, I'm just convinced that what the Lord is trying to do uh, is cause us to live out our faith. The, the book letter to the American church or the original title was faith without works is dead because mm -hmm. I believe that's the American heresy that, Oh, I just believe all the stuff I'm saved. Well, no, you're not. If you don't live it out, it proves you don't really believe it. So you're fooling yourself that you have faith because you're not living it out. Faith without works is dead. So is. I am, really hopeful that that's part of what God is doing in America right now. I'm, I'm hopeful. You know, faith is an action. It's a verb as well. And if you look scripturally from the old Testament on people in the prophetic and, you know, teachers and those, they were always embroiled in political matters. They were always found themselves in the middle of political matters, national matters, city matters, you know, Jesus himself. I mean, when Jesus said, give to Caesar, what is Caesar's and give to God? What is God's? That was one of the most politically charged statements that anyone made in that environment because he was saying Caesar's not God and they believe Caesar to be God. So the, the enemy used willing vessels to try to sift that out of the church literally, because we're really supposed to be in the center of influencing that and, and being the standard and carrying the standard that God as believers has have called us to carry. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord raises a standard against it. We are the standard right now. We are the standard bearers. And so we have to understand that the Lord has quickened us in this hour to activate our faith because the word of God is living and active. You got to activate that's, it. That's the bottom line. The activation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've, 
I, I've just been so disgusted at people who they they talk about it like, well, it's what I believe, but I believe what I believe. Well, if you're not living it out, yeah, it's kind of proof you don't really believe it. And Bonhoeffer was big on this. He called mm -hmm. it faith in action. He saw it in the black church in America. He comes to America. He sees all these dead white mainline Protestant churches in New York City, all these sophisticated churchgoers not living out their faith, just being merely religious. But in the black church, because there was suffering, uh, he saw real faith. This was 1930. Yeah. And, uncomfortability. and that's where we are today. How many churches are just, they're just doing church. They're not living out their faith. The Lord calls us to live out our faith beyond the building of the church, beyond Sunday morning. And that's what the church is supposed to be. So I believe in, we're living in an historic hour and the Lord I is do. calling the church to be the church. And we're going to see some amazing things. I actually, um, I'm, I'm hopeful about it, but I know we're in a war. So it's not easy, but praise the Lord. It is what it is. He's called us to this battle. Praise the Lord. He has called us to it and he has equipped us for it. He has readied us for it. And we are meant in this very historic time at the precipice of what's happening in this nation. We are meant to fight it for the Lord, to bring glory to the Lord, to bring conviction to America, to bring conviction to America because you need renewal to have revival. You need people to renew their hearts, renew the covenant, renew their relationship with the Lord fully and completely and in all surrender to have revival. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Eric, it has been so wonderful having you on. Well, you cheer me up every time. Uh, and I just, uh, I, I know God is at work uh, in, mm. in our time and he has, he's called each of us to do something. And that's why people say, what can I do? What can I do? Everybody can do something. First of Amen. all, you need to know that God expects you to do something, not to sit on your hands, not say, well, I'm praying. Yes, you're supposed to pray, but you're supposed to pray that the Lord would lead you to do whatever you can do. And not just to say, well, I believe, and it's just about my salvation. It's not just about your salvation. The Lord has called us uh, to be his servants and to act for his purposes and to mm -hmm. do the things that he's calling us to do. And so um, I, I just, I believe that that is happening. But uh, that that the Lord is is he wants to have mercy on us, yes. uh, but he will not force us to do the right thing. So I know there are people listening to this right now that they're going to churches that not only would they never screen this movie, but the churches are saying, well, we don't we don't, we don't do politics. We just do church. Folks, that is that is false. That is no, mm -hmm. the, the hour is too late for you to give your tithe and your time to That's a right. church like that. The churches in Germany that were just doing church when they might have stood self-sacrificially, heroically, as the Lord called them to do. I, I cannot imagine what it would be like after you saw what happened in Germany to have attended a church like that and to think we did not speak up. We did not do what we could. Why? Because we were fearful. Why? Because we didn't have the faith we claimed to have. We claimed to have faith, but we didn't live like we had faith. We lived like we're hedging our bets. Bonhoeffer lived like a man who actually believed Jesus defeated death on the cross. Amen. And the Lord's calling us to that kind of a faith. And by the way, it just so happens it's true. So it's not like we've got to work it up. It's true. The Lord's simply calling us to believe what is true and to act as though we believe it's true. So it's a, it's a glorious moment for the church if the church will stand. I believe that. Yep. Put on the full, full armor of God and stand. Stand. And stand. I'll say it again. The website is letter to the American mm -hmm. free for anybody that wants to have a free screening at their church. It's it's free. This is there's no strings attached. Mm -hmm. Letter to the American Church.com. I really believe that, you know, we we want we want to start a movement in America. Um, this is to save this nation yeah. for the Lord's purposes in history. Amen. And I, and what I say in the new book, uh, and we could talk about this an, another time after the book comes out, but in religionless Christianity, I say that we're in our third existential crisis in America. The first was the revolution mm -hmm. uh, when we ought never to have come into existence. So that's the first existential crisis. We ought never to have come into existence as a nation ever. Should never have happened that's without true. the Lord's dramatic, miraculous uh, power to yes. make that happen. That's a fact if you know that history. Never mm -hmm. should have happened. The Lord made it happen. Similarly, the, the Civil War was an existential crisis. We should not have gotten through that the way we did. If you know that history, the Lord miraculously made it happen. And we are now in our third existential crisis. And we are, it's not easy, but the Lord has called us to this. This is a big deal. And mm -hmm. if we would, you know, uh, 
Lincoln referred, I said to it earlier, referred to it earlier, Lincoln said that, you know, we, that we would have a new birth of freedom. I really believe that he was speaking prophetically in the same way that Bonhoeffer was speaking prophetically when he referred to religionless Christian, he's pointing to the future and a new birth of freedom. We never had that new birth of freedom. When, when, when we won the civil war and Lincoln gets shot right after that and reconstruction, it was a mess. Uh, The South tried to undo um, what uh, Lincoln and others yeah. had done. Okay. The Ku Klux Klan ran things as though slavery had never ended. I mean, it was wickedness, wickedness, wickedness. And, and unto this day, we've never had the new birth of freedom that I think Lincoln was prophesying. And I believe we could have that new birth of freedom uh, if we continue to fight now, Amen. if the church will fight. So the, the website's letter to the American church.com. And I hope that uh, churches will have screenings and uh, see what God says to you through the film. Ask him to lead you. What should we do, Lord? Because he's calling everybody to do different things. That's right. But we've got to be all in. This is a, a war between good and evil. And the Lord calls us to stand up. Amen, Eric. Amen. Amen. And also, uh, we will be, when um, his book comes out in April, we'll make sure to put out a post about it. Religionless Christianity, God's answer to evil. I'm looking forward to reading that. There's some crazy stuff in there, crazy okay. in a good way. And I really look forward to talking to you about it in particular. There's some stuff in there I think that will have an, uh, an interesting conversation. I just did the audio book for it. So okay. when you read an audio book, it's like I'm, I'm remembering what I wrote because I'm mm-hmm. reading it into the microphone. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, there's some heavy stuff in here. So yep. I pray that the Lord will use it. So I hope we can talk then. I, I hope so too. And, and, and maybe at some point I'll be able to come down to NYC and see you. Oh, I love it. You guys should come okay. down here. That would, I would okay. love that. Okay. Thank you, Eric. We love you. We love Suzanne. Love you back. Bless you. Bye-bye. God bless you. And that concludes our interview with Eric Metaxas. He's always a wealth of information. Uh, once again, you can go to letter to the American church.com to learn more about the screening of this movie. And also to learn about the book. The book is fascinating. It is incredible. It is meant for this time. So I encourage you all, if you haven't read it, uh, to please go out and read it. Also tomorrow, mark your calendars. Tomorrow at 5 p.m., we are going live with some explosive stuff. Some of it the Lord has spoken to me. Some of it is coming to pass in such an incredible way. My jaw has been on the floor along with our social media crew reading some of this stuff because it is amazing what is happening. So that is tomorrow, uh, Thursday, the 14th. Mark your calendars, 5 p.m. I believe it's Thursday because I came back from Tulsa, so my days are all screwed up. But... Thursday, March 14th, 5 p.m. We will be putting out a post and announcement about it. We will be going live with some explosive things that are happening, that are coming to pass right now. It is incredible, and we hope to see all of you then. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. God bless you. Keep the faith. Armor up according to Ephesians chapter 6. Psalm 91, I say it every single day. The word is living and active. We have to activate it. Also, Psalm 23, Psalm 34, Psalm 35. Uh, Ephesians chapters 1, 3, and 6. There are specific scriptures in Ephesians 1 and 3, especially I say every day uh, in accordance with the believer's authority by Pastor Kenneth Hagen and the Lord's Prayer. I encourage all of you to do that. Jesus taught his disciples to pray that way. The order to that prayer is so important. And if he taught his disciples, we need to take note of that and do the same. So thank you everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. We love you. There's Chester peeking in right as we're ending. Um, And we'll see you tomorrow night. Hello everyone, Amanda Grace here. So as many of you know, Dr. Mark Sherwood and Dr. Michelle Sherwood of the Functional Medical Institute are mine and Chris's doctors. And so I went to Dr. Sherwood with a problem that I was seeing, not only with with what I was going through, but with what other women were going through concerning their metabolism, concerning energy, concerning their hormones. And so we put our heads together and we are very happy now to finally be able to present to you Rafa for women. Rafa means healer in Hebrew. So it is an ode to the Lord because he is our healer. He put things in the earth that help heal us. And so Rafa is a product that was created for that. 
It also helps by helping with a healthy metabolism and natural hormones, as well as it helps balance fatigue. It helps with weight gain, night sweats, mood swings, blood sugar issues, and more. It is all natural. And I find more and more people are going into the natural arena in order to find solutions to issues that they're going through. So if you'd like to learn more, you could go to www.arcofgrace.org forward slash ministry dash partners to learn more about Rafa today. God bless. Hey everyone, Amanda Grace here. If you are looking for advice on financial matters, if you think gold and silver might be right for you, go to bh-pm.com today. Andrew Sorcini of Beverly Hills Precious Metals, who has been on Ark of Grace many times and loves to answer our viewer questions, is here with his team to answer all of your gold and silver needs. Whether you want to buy gold and silver, whether you have questions to see if it's right for you, whether you are looking to roll over retirement accounts. Go to bh-pm.com today and Andrew and his team will be more than happy to assist you with all of your needs. If you want to support an amazing patriot and be a blessing, go to mypillow.com today and use promo code ARK, A-R-K, to save up to 66% or more off of all MyPillow products. They have pillows, of course, but they are so much more than pillows. They have sheets. They have slippers. They have bathrobes. They even have dog beds. And a fun fact for all of you, Noble, one of our pigs in our animal sanctuary, has indeed slept on a MyPillow dog bed. So if you want to be a blessing, you can go to MyPillow.com today and use promo code ARC. It is an alternative to big pharma based on quantum physics, over 40 scripture verses written into these patches for everything from blood sugar, anxiety, pain, neuropathy, to immune system boost, dog pain. They are very sincere about um, having alternatives to big pharma. We are a big advocate of natural solutions to help with pain and, and, and blood sugar and a host of other issues. I yeah. tried the pain patches and, yeah. and they worked when I used them. When you connect it to your body, the skin patch changes changes your brain waves. Sugar, this one is neuropathy. I actually have it on. And we use this on Toby, actually, because Toby's about eight years old. And from being paralyzed years ago and the Lord miraculously healing him, he has a little leftover with his joints and his hips. So we actually give him the doggy pain patches. What was he doing? He was running? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I walked him out. And wow, he's boom. And he got power. I said, no way. And I don't know. I said, Amanda, what? What did you do to him? To <laughs> <laughs> so it's good.